Chapter 24, The World at War, 1937-1945. So we're talking about World War II in this chapter. So a few chapters ago, we had World War I. Of course, they didn't call it that. They, they had nothing to gauge that name. by. You, you have to have another one before they start calling them World Wars. World War I was called the Great War or the War to End All Wars. It was so awful and so atrocious and so so bad and such a huge loss of life that we'll never make that mistake again. So so much so that Congress voted against Woodrow Wilson's League of Nations that could have potentially brought European countries to the table to negotiate their differences before you have another war, but they voted that down. So Woodrow Wilson might be turned over in his grave when World War II starts. So you remember I said an angry and bitter Adolf Hitler rose out of the ashes from a trench in France. Well, he does, and he keeps on coming, and he becomes the Chancellor of Germany by 1932. Uh, so 29 years old um, by the end of World War I, and then he has a slow climb to power. By 1932, age 43, he's the chancellor. He's intent on restoring Germany's pride, and his mind and many other Germans was stolen from them because of that Treaty of Versailles that ended World War I and the $33 billion reparation debt. After World War One, and we've seen this, Germany was defeated and crushed and not allowed to build up arms. They were seen as the aggressors of World War One. So the other European countries, the victors, part of the of the treaty was to not allow them to build arms and become a military power again. So the Germans saw their future as very bleak, and especially this man here, and he becomes the leader of this of this new somewhat rise to power that what that will happen in a in a you know 20 20 year period or so um after world war one between between world war one and world war two the the rise of hitler and the nazi nazi party uh so hitler comes in he wants a country run by fascism so what is fascism well here's 11 steps to fascism invoke a threat number two establish secret prisons number three develop paramilitary for a paramilitary force number four surveil ordinary citizens number five infiltrate citizens groups number six arbitrarily detain citizens number seven target key individuals eight restrict the press nine cast dissent as treason ten subvert the rule of law 11. Disarm the citizen. Hmm. Sounds a lot, lot like what's going on today in America. I'm kidding. Not entirely. But some of this is the is is interesting. Uh, Donald Trump is, has been uh, accused and you know of restricting the press and try and trying to trying to end a free press. And you know, the, these are these are core uh, values that are the cornerstone of America. So you don't want to be having a president that's going to say the press is lying to you. But so this is this is a this is an issue that's that of course is today bringing the past to the present. We still we still we don't live in this world. But some of these some some of these actually are are relevant to what's going on today. Okay. So according to your book, fascism is an authoritarian system of government characteristic characterized by dictatorial rule, extreme nationalism disdain for civil society, and a conviction that imperialism and warfare are the principal means by which nations obtain greatness. <clears throat> These are not friendly people of fascists. Authoritarian system of government, dictatorial rule, extreme nationalism, your country's right no matter what. You only show the good parts. We talked about that in the first the lecture of this class. Disdain for civil society and imperialism and warfare are, are the ways that, that a country attains greatness. This this is Hitler's point of view. So of course this is opposite of the ideals of America and, and Western Europe. So the, the idea of living in a country like that is fearful to Americans and Europeans. And of course in America, the thought amongst people, typical citizens, are is there a chance that this could happen? Could could this man Hitler actually defeat us and implement this type of government. Okay, so let's start today with a short film on the rise of Hitler. This is a dramatized popular history film based on primary documents of that time and archival films of that era. So please watch the film, The Rise of Hitler, Part 1. Okay, so Hitler became the face of evil in, in this war, and his, his 
idea was based on white supremacy. So we, we hear that word today, white supremacy. This is this is the 30s. We're talking about white supremacy. Hitler believed in his super race, the Aryan super race, blonde hair, blue eyes, and white. All things that he was not, by the way. Well, he was white, but not blonde hair and blue eyes. In fact, it would be interesting today to do a genealogy test on Hitler. Many people believe that he actually had Jewish blood in him that he was so vehemently against. So this is this is Hitler's idea of, of what the world should be, the super race and get rid of everybody else. Uh, he also has allies. Japan and Italy were also based on the idea of imperialism and warfare. So Japan, an island, and not a small, tiny island, but still an island, not not like the United States or, or even Germany. You know, you, you don't have a, a huge amount of land. So you've got to go elsewhere to find raw materials to feed your empire. Uh, Japan's landlocked on an island. So you have to venture out and conquer to find resources to run your imperial machine. And they do this in China, as we'll see. Also, Italy under Benito Mussolini, also a small country, a peninsula, not, um, you know, brimming with raw, raw resources to run a war machine. So they've got to go out and, and conquer other places. Uh, but they're also angry with the Treaty of Versailles, um, to Italy. They lost many colonial lands due to the treaty. Uh, so these, these, uh, these, these people have this, these three countries have this in common. You know, we, we have this same kind of aggressive approach. We need raw materials and we want to, by imperialism, conquer, you know, perhaps not the entire world, but, but at least a lot of it. And I think Hitler, of course, had the entire world in, in his mind. Uh, so these, these three countries would form what become what became known as the Axis powers in World War II, Axis, Nazi Germany, Imperial Japan, and Italy. Okay. So what's an axis? Well, I mean, we know the, the earth revolves around an axis, but it's a little bit different definition in this case. A line of advance assigned for purposes of control, often a road or a group of roads or a designated series of locations extending in the direction of the enemy. So you could say all roads lead to the enemy. Okay, that's what an axis power kind of uh, ideology would be. So the Nazi party comes to power in Germany in 1933-32. Hitler became chancellor. They believed in the extermination of inferior races. They want the they want that blonde, blue-eyed Aryan man to be the, the their ideal. So let's get rid of what they call inferior races. And they commit what we today call ethnic cleansing. You get rid of undesirable people, anybody that's not exactly the way that, that they were, okay? Uh, and we'll talk more about, about that uh, practice here later in this chapter. So Hitler as he comes to power, violates the Treaty of Versailles and secretly starts to rearm Germany. Now, I don't know how secret it was, but he wasn't being, you know, outward about it because he didn't want to, he didn't want to create a problem with the other, other European countries. Uh, Hitler and Mussolini formed the Rome-Berlin axis early on here. Uh, they, so they become partners. We're not going to, we have an alliance, the Pact of Steel, where we're going to be on the same side and we're going to conquer. Uh, so after this Rome Berlin axis, war in Europe, it was only a matter of time. It, it, it was it was gonna it was gonna happen. There's there's no denying it. Now where's America in all this? They they remain isolationist, same as before, Monroe Doctrine, 1823, still talking about it, still still turning to the, the Monroe Doctrine a hundred and what 20 years later. We don't want to be part of Europe's problems, wars, issues, ideologies. We left you. We're over here. We're in the new world. You're in the old world. You know, leave us alone. So even though you're our family and brethren, we all we came from you. We don't want to be part of your mess. OK, so the United States passed the Neutrality Act of 1935. Uh, and there's uh, this includes an embargo on selling arms to countries at war. It also told American travelers that you travel at your own risk. We remember the Lusitania in World War I, the, the liner that was sunk by the Germans. Uh, 
So the Americans had no interest in going to war. They, they were fighting the depression at home. We, we got our own problems. You fight your own war. Okay. So, so Germany invades the Rhineland. No response. Japan invades China. No response. Italy invades Ethiopia. No response. So what, what's going on here? What, what happened to these, this treaty that was supposed to limit Germany from being aggressive? They're, they're looking kind of aggressive again. What's going on here? So you have the Munich Conference, 1938. And uh, essentially, and then there you see some of these people, that's Mussolini, you got Hitler in the middle, but these people don't look too happy. And this, Hitler was an intimidating man, and Mussolini also. They were afraid of him. So Britain and France in the Munich Conference, 1938, they agree to let Germany annex a large portion of land, the, Sud the Sudetenland. The Sudetenland, uh, Hitler claimed, was always part of Germany. It should be. It was in parts of Czechoslovakia. And he wanted to get it back. So the, the French agree. Okay, you, you can have that land. The rest of the world's going. Are, are you are you serious? You're going to let this this obviously imperialistic man? You're going to give him land? He he'll never be satisfied. Stop him right here. But they don't. Uh, so this is it's similar to this is as a comparison. The the United States government always telling Native Americans that this is it. We don't want any more. Uh, we don't want any more of your land. Then then they break the treaty and 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 here they come. Same thing here. Uh, Hitler says we're good. We're going to stop here, but he won't. Uh, so part of the non-aggression pact between Germany and Italy meant that that Italy would fight Russia in the east. You have the Eastern Front, and Germany would fight Britain and France on the Western Front. So you have two fronts, but uh, Germany, of course, is is happy. You know that. Italy will fight the Eastern Front. They can focus on the Western Front. So September 1st, 1939, World War II begins. Germany invades Poland, just, just crosses the border with tanks one day. And now he's not he's not sidestepping and hiding things and saying we're not doing He's He's blatantly out there. Yep, here we are. We have a huge army. We're going to invade and conquer, okay? We don't give, give a damn about the Treaty of Versailles. It's it it's it's useless to us. We're gonna do what we want. You can't stop us, or at least I challenge you to stop us. Okay. Uh, so this is a big moment in history. Uh, World War II begins. Uh, America declares neutrality, and they're accused of turning your back on a brother or sister in need. Uh, I mean, you're happy to sell us war products, just like World War One. You don't want to come in. You know, World War One. They they uh, America missed the first three years. Uh, same thing here. In this case, they'll miss the first two years, but in those in those years, they're selling war products and their economy is booming. So World War II will bring America out of its depression without fighting a war. Uh, so so war, even if you're not fighting a war, is still profitable. You can make profits from war. So so Hitler continues on his journey and Denmark falls, Norway, Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg, all fall to Hitler. Uh, America increases aid to Britain and, and Britain is screaming. They are bombing us relentlessly. Uh, you know, Hitler had his eyes on Britain, Great Britain. If you could, if you could uh, defeat them, they defeat France pretty early on in this war. If you can defeat them, we, we're going to have the entirety of Europe. They, they go on a huge bombing campaign and destroy most of London, kill innocent people. And Britain is saying, America, we need your help. But America does not come in, and it, but increases aid to help with the war effort. But then everything changes on December 7th, 1941, when the Japanese attack Pearl Harbor, a secret attack that nobody saw coming. They probably should have seen it coming, but they didn't. Uh, so the the Japanese attack Pearl Harbor, they destroy America's Pacific fleet. Uh, 2,400 Americans are killed. So this is one of those moments in history, American history, perhaps like the Lincoln assassination and uh, the Kennedy assassination and 9-11. These are epic, epic moments that can't be denied. The 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 biggest moments in American history, the top five, Pearl Harbor is going to be up there, perhaps perhaps number one. Uh, maybe 9-11's 
supplanted it as number one, but still a, a, a an unbelievable moment that changed the world. Uh, and this, uh, the, the Japanese are being very aggressive. They continue on a sweep through Asia and, and defeat uh, most of it. I'm sorry, not Asia, the, the Pacific Islands, uh, most of it, including the Philippines. So, so suddenly in a, in a, just a matter of 48 hours, the, the Japanese have complete control of the, of the uh, Pacific theater of this war. Uh, so, so why, why'd they do that? Why, why, why'd they attack Pearl Harbor? Well, the, the, uh, because Japan invaded China, you know, without any real cause, America decided to punish them for being aggressive like that by stop first restricting then stopping oil shipments again they're a small country they need raw resources from other places to survive they can't manufacture enough their own oil they get oil from the united states to run their war machine well now the united states cuts them off because you are uh being aggressive uh so this creates a desperate need for Japan. They, oh my gosh, what do we do? So they felt that they needed to strike, make a make a strike, make a statement, and boy did they ever, to stay relevant as a as a world power. So the United States declares war on Japan. Interesting, uh, the one of the generals that 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 uh, led the attack on uh, Pearl Harbor, Yamamoto. I fear all we have done is to awaken a sleeping giant and fill him with the terrible resolve. You know, it's it's kind of like walking down the street and the and the and the and the uh, you know vicious dog is asleep on the ground as you walk by. You're not going to kick it to wake it up, right? You, oh, there's that vicious dog. I'm going to keep walking. That's kind of what the, what he's saying here. Yeah, you know, the yeah we we caught the United States sleeping here. They, they weren't paying attention and and we have our huge victory but man they're going to be angry now and they may have more resources than we do so they're going to come back and hit us hard so this is how this this is how the united states um enters the war <clears throat> uh <clears throat> germany and italy because they they are allies of of japan they they also declare war on the United States. So United States declares war in Japan, Germany, Italy declares war in the United States, and World War II is off and running. <clears throat> so Franklin Roosevelt very famously called the attack of December 7th a day that will live in infamy. What's infamy? Being being well known for some for some evil or wicked act. So famous means a good thing, infamous means a bad thing. Uh Okay, let's look at a short film here regarding Japan. This is a propaganda film from that time, from that era. A primary source here. Uh, the, the narrator is ja is Japanese, but speaks in English because it because it was made for the United States, for the American people to see to intimidate them. And you, you're going to see this in movie theaters between movies. In those days, when you went to the movies, you saw two movies. You saw the first movie. Then you had a you had an intermission. Then you saw the second movie. Um, so in those days during the war, they would they would show uh, films and clips about about the war effort and what was going on. This would be this would be one of the films that you'd see in a movie theater. Uh, so please go ahead and watch the film Land of the Rising Sun, uh, World War II, Imperial Japan. Go ahead and watch that film and come on back. Okay, so that's an interesting film. I mean, that's a propaganda film of that era. That's and and you can kind of see how this works. Japan is trying to intimidate America and make them fearful and and make them shrink. You know, we we've hit you hard, but don't think you'll come at us because you can't beat us because we are committed. You're not. You're soft. We're not. We don't care about. The, the things that you care about, all we care about is beating you. You can't beat us. But what's interesting about this film is the truth of the film. Now, that's what we're about in this class, right? The truth. The truth about that film is that that was not made by the Japanese government. That was made by the United States government to, to, to make people think it was the Japanese government. Okay, so I don't know how, how you feel about that. 
Um, I'm not sure you get away with that today. Uh, that might be a a breach of freedom of press. I'm not sure. Uh, but again, so so what what would be America's reason for doing that? Well, obviously the American government is a little fearful that perhaps the Americans are soft and aren't going to take the challenge, you know, uh, to the extreme. Uh, it it was to scare them. These are the people that are coming after you. So it's a very it's a very racist film to to portray these people as these vicious, bloodthirsty, never gonna quit. I mean, you know, come on, it's 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 a it's a United States portrayal of them, not their own. Um, now, of course, you could argue that maybe it was true. I mean, all those things were true. They 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 were aggressive. They were imperialistic, and and they and they did have a resolve to never surrender. But still, it's it, you're creating racial stereotypes here. Um, okay, so so Pearl Harbor started for uh, all for America, <clears throat> and this 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 resulted in an immediate change in the United States economy, an economic boost <clears throat> that would finally get America out of its depression because it's about the production of war goods, and suddenly America is manufacturing like crazy. Uh, Congress passes the War Powers Act, gave the president sweeping powers to conduct the war, initiate and terminate war contracts, uh, censorship allowed, uh, all these types of things that happened during the war. War powers mean that everything else is off the off the books right now. The Constitution, we have a war. We're going to we're going to give the president all these powers. Uh, and this is a dangerous move. And I, I'm not suggesting that Roosevelt would have done it, but this is where coups come from. You give someone that much power, and he takes over the government for himself. He didn't do that, and I'm not, I'm not suggesting that he was thinking about it, but this is where coups come from. That This is where a government puts the power in someone's hands to overthrow them. So it, it's a, it's a interesting act that, that, that could have had you know um, a different effect. Okay, let's do a supplemental lecture right here. Number nine, this is the first one of our second half of our class. We've done one through eight. That's behind us. Uh, this is called the Opportunities of World War II, okay? And here is our outline. Number one, introduction. War is good for the economy. We talked about that. But but also people gain opportunity. So war, war ha causes an economy to boom because you're manufacturing. That gives people jobs. So who benefited from this war? In, in this sense, uh, women, Rosie the Riveter, we talked about Rosie in World War I, uh, Native American code talkers, uh, African Americans, but African Americans only experience menial labor. So they protest, they have the double B campaign, double B we'll talk about. So who, who didn't benefit from World War II? Japanese internment, we'll talk about what that was. Relevance, wars create unique opportunities for people and gives them a chance to enter mainstream society. Okay, that's the that's the theme of the of the lecture. Okay, let's get started. So so mass production at home put people to work. Like World War One, men were at the front. I'm sorry, men working these jobs in the factories were sent to the front. So these jobs open up. Who who takes advantage of them? Women. African Americans come and take advantage of these empty factory jobs. And we have the return of Rosie the River. And now, Rosie's not a real person. She's just a symbol. But this idea that women are tough like men, too. There she is. Look, look how tough she looks. She's got muscles. We can, we can do the same job as you. And they do it again. Uh, they, again, prove they can do the same job as a man. Um, not as helpless and fragile as they have, were trying to be portrayed even today. Many men still want to portray women as helpless and fragile. Uh, history would, would refute that if you study it. Okay, so women, uh, you know, come come to the forefront here, and, and this is their chance to get out of the kitchen. But but also Native Americans gained some gained some opportunity to the code talker. So what's that? Well, codes are how uh, how how your enemy uh, sends messages. You know, through through radio, uh, through through uh, radio, but anybody can hear it. So you so you can't really say I want you to attack the down the you know Lynch Road from the west. I mean, if your enemy hears that, he, they know what you're going to do. So you send messages in code. But then codes were broken. You know, it's the big, like your enemy can figure out your code, or or America figures out the enemy's code. 
Uh, so you have to constantly be changing your code so that so your enemy just doesn't know what's going on. So finally, with the Americans, they come up with with the, with the Navajo language. Uh, they use the Navajo language as a code. Very difficult to decipher. Uh, there are only a few people on the planet that are fluent Navajo speakers. It's a complicated uh, language. It's 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 hard to understand. It's hard to learn. Uh, so they started to use these codes. And they use them on both fronts, talking Pacific theater, European theater. And these codes were never broken. So these, these codes were, were unbreakable throughout the rest of the war. Also, African Americans come to the, come to, uh, the factories for the, for the work. Uh, but even, and, and some go into the army, but even at war, still segregated and given menial tasks. We are elevator boys, janitors, red caps, maids, a race in uniforms. They're, they're trying to enter mainstream America. We've done this before, World War I, and you denigrated us, you segregated us, and now here we are again. We're here to fight because we're Americans too, but you won't let us do anything that, that you know that's that's not menial. Okay. So at home, the African American community starts what is called the double B campaign. So if you if you do the victory sign, which which today would be the, the peace sign, two fingers. In in the double V, you put both hands up with two fingers. Double V means double victory. Victory in Europe, victory in Japan on the one hand, but the other on the other hand, it's victory at home. We'll fight your war, but you better give us some sort of access to our constitutional rights that have been denied us for 60, 70 years, illegally denied us because the end of world uh, civil war gave it to them. The, the uh, 14th Amendment integrated America, but it hasn't happened yet The Jim Crow South. So we'll fight your war, but we want victory at war and victory at home at the same time. Uh, so, you know, America has to take a look at itself here. And, and for the first time, because you're out there, and you, even though you'd seen some of this in World War I, America's criticized for, for being hypocrites and being contradictory. Uh, you, you claim you're fighting Nazi aggression in Europe because it's about liberty, equality, and freedom, while you're discriminating blacks in your own country at the same time. So this would, this would become a very key point post-World War uh, when America enters the Cold War with, with the Soviet Union, Russia, and America goes on a, a, a crusade and campaign to fight against communism because it's, it's anti-democratic and it takes away our freedoms and, and liberties. Uh, but yet, but you, you, you claim all these things, but yet you, you are discriminating against your own people at home. Uh, so, so here, so here you are, World War II. You're fighting anti-Semitism. You're fighting all these, all these things that Germany's doing. That you allow for the same discrimination at home with African Americans. So, so the African American community protests. If Negro men can carry guns for Uncle Sam, surely they can drive milk wagons for Bowman Berry. We can go fight your war, but you won't give us a job. Okay, so so they they fight back. And this is a quote out of your book. This is a war for freedom. Who's freedom? If they meant the freedom of, of the Negroes in the southern United States, my gun's on my shoulder. W. E. B. Du Bois. So what's what's he mean? What's he saying? We're we're all in to fight for freedoms in America and fight for the ideals of America, but only if we're included. Only if it means freedom in the southern United States. I'll go fight your war, but but give me my freedom that I should already have in, in return, okay? Uh, I mean, it makes sense, but, but discrimination is deeply ingrained in the American fabric. It wasn't that easy, and some groups did not gain opportunities, uh, but instead continue to have a lack of them. So we go back to the Trail of Tears, and that, that really is a subject for the class of the first half of the United States, but I've probably referred to it in the past this is, the, this is when a, American President Andrew Jackson removed the Native Americans from the southern states uh, ag against the Supreme Court ruling. 
and said that we don't want you here. We, we want your lands for plantations. Get out of here. And they were forced to walk uh, eight, nine hundred miles um, in, in weather. And many of them died. Uh, a, a very infamous, shameful moment in American history. And, and we think we learn from our past. We don't make these mistakes again. This, this was a hundred years, give or take, before this incident, okay, that we're talking about with in World War II. Uh, but, but, yet, but yet proving that we don't always learn from our mistakes in history, the U.S. government, approved by Franklin Roosevelt, issues Executive Order Number 9066, uh, instructions to all persons of Japanese ancestry. What does that mean? It forced Japanese Americans from their homes and businesses to internment camps, especially in California, Oregon, Washington, the West Coast. Why? Because the Japanese came to Hawaii and we didn't see them coming. You know, what's going to stop them from coming to and, and, and invade the West Coast? And the government overreacts. And I'm talking specifically Franklin Roosevelt. He thinks all the Japanese people that were American citizens in California, Oregon, Washington, they're probably spies, or at least they might be. We better, you know, take them out of their lives and, and, and put them under our control. It, it's it's a it's a war, it's wartime. Okay. So so these these citizens, so what's a citizen born on the soil? You get you get all the um all the uh advantages of of, of what a citizen gets, okay? doesn't matter what color you are since the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment integrated America. It said any color. 1868 said that. Yeah, here we are. 1942, 2020. People still can't figure that out. You know, an, an American is an American of all different colors. Americans aren't just white. Americans are all different people. If you're born here, you're an American citizen. You deserve the same treat me as anybody else, but here these people taken from their homes. Most were farmers that had their own farms and their own businesses, you know, productive American citizens that had no connection to Imperial Japan. Of course, they have family in Japan, but much like Germans and Italians, Americans had family in Germany, Italy. You're fighting them too. Nobody put them in camps. So why, why just the Japanese? So these people lost everything, <clears throat> homes, businesses, and, and most never got them back. And, and they're put in these camps. Uh, it, it's a prison camp. Now, this is not a concentration camp like the Germans did, and people weren't killed here, but they were kept from living their lives and forced to live like this for, for the duration of the war. Uh, so, you know. And this, these are American citizens. Uh, German Italians weren't put in camps. Why? German Italians, it, this is 1942, looked like the ideal, what was considered to be the ideal American, which was white. These people aren't white, so we're going to intern them. <clears throat> Very shameful moment. And and here you go. That if you if you need any more. Uh, evidence, here you go. This is General John DeWitt at that time. A Jap is a Jap. Makes no difference whether he is an American citizen or not. Well, General DeWitt, you are 100% absolutely wrong. That That is a grievous mistake. An American citizen is gets the same opportunities as anybody else. Same protection. A Jap is a Jap. I mean, this is awful, awful racism that would get, get, a, get a man fired in a, in a, in a second today. Uh, so, so we we've come a distance, but in the, in these days, this was perfectly legitimate uh, way to talk, <clears throat> and in fact, it inspired people. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> so again, most of these Japanese people have been born in the United States, but it didn't matter. This was based on appearance only, uh, because, like I said, the Italians and Germans they were not interned. Now, someone might argue, well, but they didn't attack Pearl Harbor and they didn't create that fear in the West Coast. And 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 I I, I I'll give you that, but still, uh, they they what they were doing in Germany and Italy was a lot worse, you could you could say. So that that argument's a little thin thin to me. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so the relevance of the lecture: wars create unique opportunities for people and gives them a chance to enter mainstream society. Okay. Okay, that is the end of lecture number, supplemental lecture number nine. Uh, let's move on. So let's just, to, to finish this subject, 
watch the film Japanese internment during World War II. Kind of give us a background on what that was about. Okay, go ahead and watch that film and come on back. Okay, so so what was this war all about? Uh, this is a real war for freedom. A loss would have been disastrous for democracy in the world. If, if Hitler and Mussolini would have had their way and taken over the world, the world we live in today would be a fascist world, very bleak, very inhuman, a very strong, harsh leadership at the top, oppressing everybody else, okay? Uh, so you you could say that this this is a war that was worth fighting uh, because it's, you're you're fighting for your freedoms. So so this war begins. This it's the Allies versus the Axis. The Allies, Great Britain, France, United States, but only after Pearl Harbor and Russia. So Russia kind of bouncing around here as far as their loyalties. World War I, they were allies, and then they, they exited after the Bolshevik Revolution, leaving the Eastern Front open. Now they come in, and they actually are, are somewhat with Hitler at first. Then Hitler, you know, uh, invades them. So they switch sides, come to the allies. So the, so the Russians are kind of all over the place a little bit. Um, Making clear in this in this air that we are not of the allied uh, mindset or ideology. This is our best choice given given the circumstance. But we are not going to be part of you or live our lives like you. We are not going to be democracy. We're going to have a different point of view when this war is over, and we'll talk about that uh, next chapter or two. Okay. Uh, of course, the Axis: Germany, Italy, Japan. But a, a key to understand here for America is it, is it rises out of its depression. America's economy is booming very quickly. The depression is just, it didn't happen overnight, but short, short period of time, the depression's over. Um, and a military is formed. You hadn't had a need for a military since World War I, so it was small and nothing of, of any kind of note. You got to build it quickly. And it's not it's not just it's not just people, it's tanks and ships and planes and everything else to, to fight a war of, of this of this size. Uh, but as it's as it's formed, it's still segregated. You know, uh, very few African Americans saw combat duty. Some did, but but most did not. Um, what about women? It, it 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 gave women an opportunity. Could could women join the military? Well, no, not like today. Not like you could just join the army or the air force, but you could go into what was called the WACs, women's air, uh, women's army corps, sorry, and the waves. The waves was women accepted for volunteer emergency services. So they would they they were, many were nurses. They saw no combat. Many did similar jobs that women would do at home: secretarial, communications, healthcare. If you were a black woman, you did maid work, okay? Go ahead and watch the film, WAC, Women's Army Corps. It's your war too. Watch that film and then come on back. <clears throat> of course, you still have the concern for women's safety in this environment. <clears throat> Fathers, husbands, brothers, boyfriends <clears throat> are, are very concerned that their, their loved ones, their, their, the, the women in their lives are leaving and going across the country. They're going to be around all these all these soldiers, men, will they be safe? Uh, could women take care of themselves? So, so again, I'll make the same argument I made before. It, it, isn't it? Isn't it somewhat insulting to think otherwise? Uh, women can take care of themselves. They do it every day. Uh, but understand, in this era, it's still new to be in and about society. You still have those old Victorian morals that still pervaded. Uh, and like I said, women even even today on some level are still working through it. OK. OK, that is the end of Chapter 24, Part 1. Please go on to Chapter 24, Part 2. Thank you.